Well, thanks for coming back. I hope you got some coffee for the remaining part of this day. And now we have another presentation, and this comes from an end user. And I think that presentation from end users are really interesting because it tells us how the journey has been on certain areas on observability, the challenge that they face it, and how they overcome, hopefully, those challenges. So today we have David Gober, who comes from Monday.com, and he's going to talk to us about the presentation called The Road to Observability Everywhere at Monday.com. So let's welcome David with applause. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. I'm David. I'm excited to be here. And today I want to share with you the story of our observability journey in Monday. But before that, I want to talk a little about racing. Any Formula One fans here? Nice. Sometimes I bring this subject and there's like this awkward silence and I think to myself, maybe choose like football next time. <laughs> so, as you can see, Formula One cars have evolved a lot since the early 1950s. The first designs, the one that you see on the left, they were these cigar-shaped cars, and the focus was more on the engines and mechanical reliability and the skill of the driver, and less on aerodynamic efficiency. And as the sport evolved, engineers began experimenting with different shapes and configurations that make the car more stable in greater speeds. But according to Formula One rules, you couldn't just take your, track, take your car to the track whenever you feel like it. The only time for any kind of aerodynamic testing was only a few days before the race weekend. And even then, to gather any meaningful data, you would have to drive the car for a few laps. And in the late 1960s came wind tunnels. Engineers would build scaled-down versions of their cars and put them next to a big fan. And they now had a controlled environment that provides data on how your car interacts with the air around it. It was a big step forward, but it still had its drawbacks. It was still slow and expensive. I was still limited by building the versions of the cars that I wanted to test. In the late 1990s, as processing power increased, teams started using simulations for their aerodynamic analysis. These simulations used algorithms that predicted air movement at any point around the car. They gave insights on vortex formation and air pressure distribution, and even provide recommendations on the optimal car structure. Why am I telling you this nice story? As teams look to gain any competitive advantage, cars became more complex. They now have front wings and rear wings and diffusers and multiple aerodynamic elements that need to work together. In the beginning, it would take teams to It'd take weeks to build the car and then wait some more to drive it around the track or rent out a wind tunnel, all just to test a single configuration change. Today, as a Formula One engineer, I can iterate much faster. I can test hundreds of possible designs in a matter of hours without even building a single car. And I can even get recommendations on which car I should build. This is a great example of testing methods that evolved alongside the increase in car complexity. And I wish I could say the same about our software systems, but I don't see a similar evolution. Even though our software has progressed dramatically, moving from monolithic architectures to distributed systems with containers and services and complex communication patterns, our testing methods did not catch up. Our software became really difficult to reason about. So how we as engineers gain back that confidence when there is so much stuff going on? Hopefully I'll be able to show you how we tackle this problem. Bit of intro on Monday. Monday provides a work management platform that helps teams organize their projects and workflows all in one place. It is a highly visual and customizable platform that teams can tailor to fit their use cases. And the use cases are many. They range from simple project management to CRM, which is the product I work on as a software engineer. Customer relationship management software, or CRM in short, is a tool 
that helps the businesses manage their interactions with customers. It stores the customer's information, such as the business can see every interaction it had with each customer, allowing them to provide a better service. And one of your basic building blocks as a business using CRM is your contacts in the form of a board where users can manage their contacts or their leads, and users like to assign each contact with a priority. So let's take, for example, the ability to change the priority of the contact, let's say from medium to high. You can imagine how crucial this ability is. It happens millions of times per day on our platform. It is a golden flow that users take for granted, like picking up your phone and seeing the screen turn on. It cannot break under any circumstances. So how do we achieve this level of confidence in such a business critical flow? Our initial approach was to load up a test environment of Monday containing all the necessary services for this transaction. We would then try to perform this operation with an API request that will change the priority and get back an API response. This is basically an integration test. And that's what we did. But we quickly realized that this provides us with a false sense of security because verifying the external behavior of the system is just not enough. The expected outcome is measured by much more than just returning the correct response. For starters, there is the data layer. Did we cache this new value correctly? Did we use the correct database queries? Our boards can get quite big, so we apply different optimization techniques during our writes. Depends on how many contacts the user has. And this has performance implications. So if something recently changed with regards to how we persist information, we would like to know about it during the test. We also have both third party and in-house analytic services that perform aggregations on user data. How do we validate the outcome of a third party API in this kind of test? This is something we found is very hard to achieve. And there's also the challenge of testing side effects. Users can configure if this then that style actions. So changing the priority of the contact can trigger multiple different actions, like notifying someone or sending an email. This means that I now have downstream consumer processes to worry about, and I need to make sure they are executed correctly. And you can see where this is going. The distributed nature of the system makes it difficult to predict the outcome based solely on the initial API call. Even if we somehow manage to build an infrastructure that will validate all of this, we would have to deep dive into different ecosystems of languages and tool chains. And we didn't even talk about what happens when this test fails. How do you find the root cause? I started my career in embedded applications and I thought that debugging kernel models was hard, but eventually all the gray hairs on my head came from distributed systems. So we already know that this is exactly the kind of problem that Open Telemetry wants to solve, this universal deep way of observing to the system. And at that point, we were already reaping the fruits of a multi-year project to instrument our production systems. And we thought, why not use open telemetry to solve our testing problem as well? So let's see how we can improve on that. We take the same scenario with the same API request, but in addition, we also collect all the trace data that is emitted during the request. This works by injecting a trace parent in the API request. The traces are then collected as normal in the open telemetry collector which in turn sends it into a trace store. And then you have trace test, which is basically an agent that sits in your environment and starts polling for traces that are associated with this request. This means we can now perform our assertions on a vast pool of data in the form of database, network, and application logic traces. Going back to our, to our challenges earlier, by examining the spans, we can now verify that our cache mechanism is working as expected that we are using the correct database optimizations when writing to the database, that our analytic services is aggregating on the correct metadata, and we can even get confirmations from downstream message queues that were triggered following this action. 
And this was great. We felt pretty good with this outcome. We created a process that tests the combined effort of multiple engineering teams. So we packaged all these assertions into a trace test and we put it in our CI. So now if any of these teams introduce a change that will break our assumptions about our system, we will catch it early. And the next thought was, why stop here? Let's enable those teams with the ability to run this trace test locally so they can get feedback faster and expand upon it. Okay, so at that point, each developer uh, in its development environment had, um, um, had its own remote lightweight cluster of Monday upon which he built and tested its code. What we didn't have was observability in these local environments. Now, enabling developers with the ability to see traces during development was no small feat, but maybe it's a subject for next year's talk. For the purpose of this talk, we'll fast forward to the end result where there is now full observability support in local environments, which means that developers can run our trace test locally. Cool, so we have our trace test running in our CI and developers can run it locally. So we said, let's take the confidence level up a notch. Let's enable tracing for a more comprehensive test, the end-to-end -end test. Because most of our users are humans clicking buttons, at that point, we already had some end-to-end -end tests, which basically look like this. You load up a browser session, you log in into Monday, and then you perform the operation. You click on the button and you try to change the priority. And this is beneficial because you are also testing the user interface this way. But again, this suffered from the same visibility issues we discussed earlier. What we now want to do is to observe into everything that is happening during this browser session. So the trace-based version of this end-to-end -end test looks something like this. You have your favorite browser automation framework that loads up the browser. And the underlying mechanism is the same. When you perform the API request, you inject the trace parent into the request. And the traces are collected as usual, and you perform your assertions on the traces. And since we now had also some browser telemetry as well, we could also assert on the user interface. This is the place to shout out to all the talented people working on open telemetry JavaScript. For us, as a highly visual user interface platform where user delight is an important KPI. Being able to reason about the user interface and my backend in a single reproducible flow, to us that was amazing. Cool, so we have our trace tests in our CI, in our developer machines, and in our pre-production environments. But we are still confined to the warm, cozy environment of the wind tunnel. I'm not sure how warm it is inside the real wind tunnel, but you get the idea. Let's take our race car out to the track, to production. And I'm sure we all have our opinions on production tracing, but let's face it, no matter how hard we try, eventually production will always be this. <laughs> I'm glad you liked it. Production will always be this landscape full of unknown unknowns, and catching those edge cases is still very valuable. So if we look at how a production test look like, it's very similar to the previous end-to-end -end test. Um, you still have your browser framework and you load up a Monday session and you try to perform this operation. The only difference is that instead of directing into a test instance of Monday, you log in into the public website of Monday. And the challenge here was basically dealing with the sampling. As always in production, we have a heavy sampling involved. And here we have a challenge because we need our specific session traces to reach the trace store to be able to perform our assertions on them. And you can do that in a variety of ways. There was a great talk before the break on how to use the open telemetry processor. And that's what we did. We uh, added rules into the processor so that our session traces could reach the trace store. 
Okay, so during this journey, one of the best things we found is that because we are relying on telemetry data, these tests can run anywhere where there are traces. And because we are not testing our code, but testing the output of our code, we don't need to maintain separate tests for separate environments. We have the exact same trace test that is running everywhere. The combination of relying on trace data and reusing the tests across environments reduced test creation time from days to hours, especially for complex integration tests. In addition, we also find out that traditional testing methods uh, sometimes miss stuff because uh, breaking changes in side effects could creep their way into production even when this test passes. This is because the traditional test can only assert on the API response and not on any of the side effects. But now, when all the business critical flows are well defined with their spans and all their chain reactions, we can catch these false negatives as early as our local environment. Okay, we discussed the benefits. Now let's discuss the implications. We all know that every tech decision we make comes with its own baggage of assumptions. And there are technical assumptions and mental assumptions. Let's start with the technical. Tracing in development. You can have some of the benefits of running these tests in later stages, but eventually if you want to enable developers with that tight feedback loop, you will need to have full observability support in your local environments. Developers will need to be able to see the traces as they write the code. Your tests are as good as your instrumentation, and this shouldn't come as a surprise. Anytime you're trying to extract any conclusions from a data, you will be limited by the quality of that data. And this applies here as well. Um, trace testing will quickly confront you with the quality of your traces. And that quality may be enough for monitoring in production, but it may not be enough for testing. If your tracing metadata is incomplete or your context propagation doesn't work, then you won't be able to test for side effects. You need to be able to connect the flows. And I think that the overarching implication of all of this is that trace testing is basically observability-driven development. Traces become not just a thing that it used to monitor systems, but an integral part of the entire development lifecycle. Your testing and monitoring tool, tool chains are now one and the same. And observability becomes the shared responsibility of your entire R&D organization. I wore multiple hats in my career, first in infrastructure and now in product. And in your organization, you may find product teams with various levels of observability knowledge and adoption. And it, I'm not going to lie to you, sometimes it will feel like an uphill battle, but eventually the teams that will face the most pain with traditional testing methods are those that are the most likely to cross that adoption barrier and enable and embrace testing into their workflows. Enabling trace tests for your organization will be more successful when you first start with flows that are business critical, have no single owner, they span multiple domains, and their incident cost is high. And there was a great talk earlier about adoption in observability. And I think it's like this ongoing journey we all go through every single day, including myself, to deliver the message at scale and make engineering teams more confident in what they do. Thank you. We have a time for two questions. Anybody? Here. Thanks. Thanks for the for the story. Uh, the question is: uh, It seems that you use the observability as part of your or extension of your development process. 
are you using also the same observability stack to see basically what's happening in your runtime environments? Okay. Um, the question is no. We would much, we would very like, uh, would like to. Um, because we are still in a transition to open telemetry, we are still using proprietary vendors in production. So we started this project with enabling open telemetry in every, uh, every environment except production. And we are now transitioning into vendor neutral solutions also in our production systems. But yes, that is the, that is the end goal, having the same stack across all the environments. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, David.